it's easiest to think about vectors in terms of displacement. So we know that if we would draw some displacement vectors, like 3 meters and another one at 2 meters, if we draw these for distances and displacements, then our diagrams are very intuitive. The actual size of the vectors is referring to how big the position or the displacement is. And so with vectors like that, we might also try to find the resultant vector, which is the sum of adding those two vectors up. But we know that vectors can also refer to velocity. Velocity is a vector term, and so the length of a velocity vector would not be referring to how far something went, but how fast something went. And the faster it went, the longer the arrow is. And if we have two velocity vectors, that means there's two sources of velocity, or there's two things that affect the velocity of an object. And when we talk about a resultant, we're wondering how fast that object actually went as a result of those two components of its velocity. The trickiest part to velocity problems is going to be setting up the problem. And when we set up these problems, we're going to make sure we're clear on the difference between a component and a resultant. So the components are the individual parts, and the resultant is the sum when you add them up and, or connect them together. And the other trick about velocity problems is that they could be combined with information that requires us to use kinematics equations. So for example, if we solved for components of a velocity and found the resultant velocity, we might be asked to use that velocity in order to calculate a distance. In general, we're going to be just dealing with velocity and displacement and time, and not so much with acceleration on these problems. Now you might be wondering what sort of realistic scenario could involve two components of a velocity. And there's basically two classic situations we're going to be looking at. One of them is a plane in the wind, and another one is a boat in a stream or a current. So for example, a plane like this, of course it has a velocity that comes as a result of its propeller, that it's being propelled forward. But it's also possible that at the same time, this plane is experiencing a crosswind, which is blowing the plane toward the side. And so when we solve these types of problems, we are adding these components up in the same way that we added displacement vectors. And once again, we're going to be looking for the resultant. What was the resultant velocity that occurred as a result of those two effects from the propeller and from the wind? And just like this little sketch, it's pretty obvious that if the propeller and the wind are pushing in perpendicular directions, then the overall motion of that plane, the overall velocity, is going to be in a slightly angled direction. It's going to be critical in these problems to think in terms of a reference point, to think from whose point of view am I going to think about the velocity. So for example, we say there's something called ground velocity of a plane, which means if you are standing on the ground and you are measuring the velocity of the plane with a radar gun or something like that, what would you find out is the velocity of that plane. There's also the air velocity or air speed of the plane, which is from the plane's point of view, how fast is it moving? So the air speed is basically how fast is the propeller pushing the plane, and then there's also the wind speed. And so the air speed and the wind speed together add up to give you the ground velocity. So let's move that note up to the top, and let's look at a simple example just for setting up these problems. So I'm not going to solve to actually find the magnitude of a resultant velocity, but just to be able to set up the diagram. So suppose a small plane like this is flying north at 400 kilometers an hour in a crosswind of 75 kilometers an hour from the west. Draw the diagram showing the resultant velocity. Well, let's start with the velocity of the plane that is the result of its propeller. So, so this vector would represent the plane's velocity at 400 kilometers an hour. Remember, the longer the arrow now, the faster the speed. Now, the wind is also propelling the plane at a velocity of 75 kilometers an hour. Quick note about wind. We usually describe wind with the direction that it's coming from. So this is from the west, which means it's blowing toward the east, because in physics we like to draw the arrow toward the right direction. So since I know I want to add these arrows, these vectors up, I'm going to draw them tip to tail. So at the tip of the propeller arrow, I'm going to draw the wind arrow. 
and try to do it roughly proportional. That one has to be 75 kilometers an hour. So the wind was from the west and the arrow is pointing east. Now, of course, this is going to be in the way for my resultant vector. Let's sketch the resultant velocity. Again, it's from the start of the initial vector to the end of the final vector. And this would be the velocity resultant. And now we could use the same tr trigonometry and the same geometry, the same Pythagorean theorem methods that we used for displacement, we could apply here. We could calculate this resultant velocity, which I'm not going to do here. What I want you to see right now is how that this diagram does intuitively make sense. Our resultant velocity, or the actual velocity of this plane, if we would be observing it from the ground, would be at a slight angle. It would not be directly north because the plane is pushing, or rather the wind is pushing the plane a bit to the east. So whatever angle this is here is the angle that an observer on the ground would actually see the plane traveling. Let's just look at another very similar example, except for not with such nice angles in it. Now the plane is flying at 400 kilometers an hour, but it's at 25 degrees east of south, and the wind is also at 75 kilometers an hour, but now it's 10 degrees north of east. I'm going to use green for my airspeed now, since yellow is not going to work well on a white background. So now my plane speed, my airspeed, has to be something like this. It said... 25 degrees east of south. So if we would imagine putting our little coordinate system there, that this here would measure 25 degrees. So 25 degrees. Okay, it's 25 degrees to the east of the south line. And this time our wind speed was given just in the normal component, or the normal uh, coordinate method. So it's 10 degrees north of east. So again, if we'd imagine... We're going to start tip to tail. At the tip of this vector, we're going to draw our wind speed vector, but it's got to be 10 degrees to the north of east. So something like that. And that's actually probably a little bit long because, of course, it only has to be proportionally 75 kilometers an hour right there. So again, I've arranged all the vectors tip to tail, and I can draw the resultant vector from the start point to the finish point like that. And this is the resultant velocity, or the ground speed, of the plane. Looks pretty close to south. Of course, my diagram is probably not perfect, but again, we could go and calculate this precisely if we wanted to. So I want to do one more example problem that's in the context of a river with a current. And this one will also involve the use of kinematics kind of hidden in it. A person sets out on a canoe across a river. The river is 19 meters wide and has a current with a velocity of 0.73 meters per second west. If the person needs to arrive at a location directly across the river to the north and can row with a sustained velocity of 1.6 meters per second, in what direction should the canoe be pointed and how long will it take to reach the destination? Well, we should always start with a diagram, so let's just sketch the river that we have explained to us here. So if this is my river... I know that it is 19 meters wide from one side to the other. I also am going to have the person rowing directly north across the river, so we might as well define up as north right away. And that means we're going to start from a point down here. And now let's look at what vectors are involved. So we have the displacement vector, the 19 meters, but that's going to be kind of separate. And the rest of our information is given in velocities. So keep in mind that we're, even though we're going to draw velocities on top of a displacement sort of a picture, it means something different. So one of the other velocities we're given is the current velocity, which is 0 0.73 meters per second west. So this river has a current that is flowing 0 0.73 meters per second to the west. We also know that our canoeer can row at 1.6 meters per second in whatever direction he or she chooses, and it's the direction that we need to find out about that. And the last piece of information we're given is about the resultant, and that is that the resultant has to be directly across the river to the north. So keep in mind that that is the result of the other two vectors. As a result of the combination of rowing and river current, we want our canoe to land directly across the river. So let's draw that vector to start out with directly across the river. That is going to be our resultant velocity. Notice 
I didn't draw it all the way across the river because it doesn't mean the same thing as the displacement. This is talking about velocity. So I'm just sketching a velocity diagram on top here. Next, we could add the river current. And you might be tempted to draw the river current like this. But in fact, we need our river current to end up at the resultant velocity, right? So let's not draw it there. Let's draw our river current like this, ending up with at our resultant velocity. And then lastly, we have the canoeer that is able to row. And this will be our 1.6 meters per second. And then this diagram should make sense as referring to the velocities that are involved. So we have the canoeer rowing, but the river is also flowing at the same time. So the canoeer is going to have to point into the current. And that's actually the angle that we want to figure out, this theta here. How far into the current does our canoeer have to point so that the river pushes him or her just far enough to land exactly across the river? And then you should also recognize that the last question about how long it will take, well, that's not going to be found from our vector diagram because that's not a velocity, that's a time. So that's something we could calculate later. So for now, let's work on calculating that angle that we need. Notice how that the triangle we drew is a right triangle because our resultant is directly north and our river current is directly west. So that means we can use trigonometry. We can use, for example, SOHCAHTOA. And if you look at our diagram, the two velocities that we know are the opposite to our theta and the hypotenuse. So that means we're going to want to be using sine in this case. So we can say that the sine of our angle theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that opposite is going to be the 0 0.73 meters per second. And the hypotenuse is going to be our rowing velocity of 1.6 meters per second. So if we grab our calculator, we can say that the sine of theta is equal to 0 0.4 five, six. Look at our units quickly. Meters per second cancels with meters per second, which means we have no units at this point. And that's fine because our trigonometry is what's going to give us degrees. And a quick note to make sure your calculator is set to use degrees. So if the sine of theta equals that, we want to know just what theta equals. And the opposite operation to sine theta is the inverse sine. So we need to do the inverse sine on both sides of this equation in order to tell us what our theta actually equals. So inverse sine of that answer should give us 27.14. And this was set to degrees. So now we know that the magnitude of our angle is 27.14 degrees. Since we're dealing with two significant digits, we could round that to 27 degrees. And we're also going to clarify the direction as being east of north. Okay, so we have answered the question in what direction the canoe should be pointed. It should be pointed 27 degrees east of north. That means the rower is going to have to do some extra work against the current so that he still ends up directly north across the river. Now we're also asked how long it will take to reach the destination. And for this, let's think about how fast the canoe is actually going and how far it has to go in that direction. If we know how fast it's going and how far it's going, we should be able to use our formula, velocity equals change in distance over change in time. But keep in mind that the velocity and the distance then have to be in the same direction. Well, we only know one displacement, and that's the 19 meters. So it looks like we're going to have to calculate the velocity in that direction. So we're going to actually have to calculate the magnitude of the resultant velocity and use that in this kinematics equation to calculate the time. So we have a couple of options at this point for calculating the resultant velocity. We could use trigonometry with the angle we just calculated together with one of our velocities, or we could use the Pythagorean theorem. It's a good practice to use the option that does not rely on a previous answer, so that if we made a mistake in our previous step, we would still possibly get this one correct. So I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem here, 
And so that's of the form a squared plus b squared equals c squared to calculate the last length of our triangle here. And we're using it to calculate the resultant velocity. So let's call our resultant velocity a, doesn't matter. So our resultant velocity plus our 0 0.73 meters per second squared, well, let's square the resultant velocity as well, is what's going to be equal to our 1.6 meters per second squared. So this is just using the data directly from our triangle there. So let's do 0 0.73 and square it. And we're also going to need to square 1.6. And I'm just going to subtract them right away as well. So I'm going to do I'm going to subtract that red value from both sides. So then I would have to do my 2.56 minus my 0 0.5329. So I get my resultant velocity squared is equal to 2.0271. Units here are meters squared per second squared still, because I had meters per second and I squared it all. Now I need to square root both sides of this equation. So that's square rooting my answer. And I should get that the resultant velocity is equal to 1.4, I'm just going to leave it in two sig digs right away, meters per second. I know that this was directly north just because that was what I was told. So now again, we know our velocity directly north, we know our distance directly north. We're going to use those together in this equation to calculate how much time it will take to reach our destination directly north. So 1.4, and I'm actually going to use a few more digits here so we don't have any rounding errors. Meters per second is our velocity, is equal to our displacement of 19 meters over our change in time. Let's keep our work separate here. If I multiply both sides by our change in time, then it will cancel out from this side, and now I'll have to divide both sides by our 1.4 number. And we should get that our change in time is equal to 19 divided by that 1.4. So 19 divided by, and I'll use the answer that's stored in my calculator so it's a little more accurate, and that is 13.3 Again, I'm at the end of my question here. I can round to the right number of significant digits right away. So it should take 13 seconds to cross the river. So we've answered both parts of the question here. So you can see that these types of questions can get fairly involved sometimes. And that's nothing to be afraid of. But just keep in mind the separate parts that there are. Make sure that your velocity diagram only has velocity vectors on it and things like that and work through it step by step. I hope you enjoy.